basics of NGS, WGS, WES, and Sangal for uh, everyday practice. So, as from the topic, we can understand that uh, we are talking about the sequencing technologies. So, let's start from the very basics. So, sequencing of what is the DNA, which is the major macromolecule of inheritance in most of the living organisms. And uh, we all are aware of the term gene, which is nothing but a stretch of DNA, which translate into a functional protein. Now, gene has a different components. They are named as exons, introns, promoter, and untranslated UPRs. But the exons are the most important region of the gene that gets transcribed and translated into a functional protein. Now, whenever there is a change in the sequence or the structure of the gene, this protein gets hampered, and that manifests into the phenotype of your disease. So that is why it is important to understand the sequence and the structure of the gene. So we can classify the genomic variation on the size. For example, a single nucleotide change is commonly known as point mutation. And there are indel terms which is commonly used for deletion insertion, which could be a few base pairs to a few KBs. And then comes the structural variations that has different ranges from few uh, kilobases to hundreds of MBs that are called chromosomal variations. Uh, this is the pictorial representation of different types of mutations or variations. So, uh, for example, deletions, insertion, inversion, duplication. And here is the description of structural variations, which could be balanced, unbalanced, translocation, fusion, fission, etc. So, just to revise a few terminology on uh, point mutation or single nucleotide variation, as we very frequently come across these in various uh, sequencing reports. So, uh, we call silent mutation when there is a change in the nucleotide, but the amino acid is not changed. We call it nonsense mutation when the uh, change in nucleotide results in the creation of a stop codon, which terminates the protein abruptly. Then, missense mutation, when there is a change in nucleotide results in the change of amino acid. And frame shift mutations results from the deletion or insertion that changes the frame of the codes of the amino acids, which may or may not result in the elongated or shorter protein. Now, there are different techniques to target these genetic changes. For example, single nucleotide variations can be easily detected by simple PCR-based techniques or Sanger sequencing. And when we move ahead towards the longer stretches, so hundreds of base pairs can be detected by Sanger and another PCR techniques. Then comes the NGS panels. Then finally, whole exome and whole genome sequencing. Uh, when there is a copy number variations, it can be detected by MLPA, FISH, and other microarray techniques. And when there are chromosomal aberration, it can be detected by karyotyping. So in today's class, we are looking at these techniques, which comes under the, under the umbrella term of molecular genetics. So uh, what is sequencing? So sequencing is a method to determine the order of nucleotides. Now, most in most of the technique, it is based on fluorescence. So while synthesizing the template strand, the fluorescently based nucleotides are added, and which is detected, and the sequence is deciphered. So based on the time of discoveries, uh, the sequencing technologies can be divided into early first generation, under which the Sanger sequencing comes, second generation, under which the next generation sequencing comes, and the ongoing one is the third generation, which actually gives you the real-time long reads through NGS, being developed by PacBio and Oxford Nanopore. So in day-to-day -day practice, we come across commonly uh, NGS and Sanger sequencing. And under NGS, you have targeted panels, whole exome sequencing, and whole genome sequencing. So let's discuss one by one. Uh, so Sanger sequencing was invented in 1970s. It is a very robust technique, and it is still being used in the original form with the 
slight modification in chemistry and detection. And in each reaction of Sanger, you can detect up to 1,000 base pair of nucleotide. So it has a very simple workflow, uh, can be standardized in any lab. It is based on chain termination method where you use the dideoxy fluorescently labeled nucleotide. And this one is, this is the instrument which we have in our department, which we use for Sanger sequencing of various diseases. And it is, uh, can be analyzed by very easy, freely available softwares. So standardizing and performing a Sanger sequencing test is quite easy for any lab. So various applications are genotyping, sequencing of variable regions, validation of NGS, and genotyping of microsatellite markers. Indications for Sanger sequencing in clinical settings are you can use it for single target or single genes or smaller genes, for use of confirmation of NGS, carrier screening in family members. It can also be used for difficult sequences that does not... Uh, you get, don't get reports in NGS. And it is very important in uh, using for the genes which has pseudogenes, which is difficult to be analyzed in NGS. And again, for sequencing, the filling the gaps which you don't get in next generation sequencing. So here is the example of ADA2 gene, which is associated with DADA2 phenotype. So as you can see, the gene has nine coding exon the gene has nine coding exons and the mutation is spread out throughout the whole gene so since it is nine or 10 exons you can easily go for sanger sequencing so as i said if it is a single target or a small gene one should go for sanger sequencing this is just a representation of chromatogram which we analyze for sequencing so what are the benefits and limitations of Sanger sequencing? The benefits are it gives you very accurate data. It is cost effective. It has very simple PCR-based workflow. It is easy to analyze, and it is less error prone. However, the limitation are, limitations are uh, it has low scalability, meaning when you have a limited amount of DNA, for each reaction, you have to use that particular amount of DNA. Uh, and then you get only 1,000 base pairs per reaction. It is not cost effective for long stretches of DNA. It has low sensitivity, meaning when you have a somatic mutation, your heterogeneous population should have at least 20% of your target cells to be analyzed by Sanger sequencing. And finally, it has low discovery power. It is difficult to get a novel variants or genes through Sanger sequencing because in Sanger, we design the primer and the target should be known to us. So now coming to NGS, NGS is, in other terms, we call it massively parallel screening, and there are different platforms through which it has been developed, and most commonly used are Illumina and Iron Torrent. They differ in performances and characteristics. So what is new or next in NGS? So I'll give you this fact. The Human Genome Project took $3 billion and 13 years to complete the project. However, if NGS would have been invented by then, it would have taken only $1,000 and four to five days to complete the whole project. So you can imagine how massively parallel screening we are talking about. So in principle, it is similar to most of the sequencing chemistries, that is sequencing by synthesis. It's just that uh, millions of fragments are being sequenced in a parallel fashion. So this is a flow of the uh, overview of the workflow of Illumina-based next generation sequencing, where there are multiple steps, such as library preparation, cluster amplification, sequencing, alignment, and data analysis. I will not get into the details. I would, however, I would like to emphasize the fact regarding the uh, data analysis. So once the signal is processed, you get the raw file in FASTQ format, and then after multiple uh, quality, uh, quality scoring and filtering, you get the BAM file, which you actually align with your uh, reference genomes. And following that, you'd use multiple tools to get different types of genomic variations. For example, for single nucleotide variations, different tools are used. 
for uh, copy number variation, different tools are used. And then they are integrated, and that gives you a VCF file, which is actually um, readable. Uh, it's a CSV file, actually. So it is readable and interpretable. So from here, you can see that uh, initially generated terabytes of data is now compressed into kilobytes. However, the story does not end here. Even a single VCF file can have millions of variants. And then you have to do the filtering manually and using the other databases. So we start with filtering out the uh, structural variations, anonymous variation, and then we look at our uh, disease inheritance, whether it is autos autosomal dominant or recessive. And on the basis of that, ultimately filtering is done. And, uh, and at the end, you may have be having a few variants or a few genes in hand, which you have to correlate with your disease phenotype. So once you have the variant, you have to report according to the ACMG guidelines, which is a five-tier based guideline, uh, five-tier based classification. And whenever one of these classification is being re reported, it has to be associated with evidence. So you, whenever you look at the NGS report, you have to see the evidence for which this classification has been given for any variant. And for somatic variation, it has to be only actionable variants that is to be reported. Okay, so uh, there are two terms which are commonly used in NGS report, uh, the coverage and the depth. The coverage is the fraction of genome sequenced by at least one read. And average depth is the average number of reads that covers any given region. So here, if you see the red bars, which are actually the reads, they are aligned to the reference genome. So horizontally is called the coverage, meaning the sequence stretch that is being covered by different reads. And depth is the vertical depth, how many times that particular region has been read by the sequencer. So most commonly, when you get an exome sequencing, we, uh, we use kind of 90x or 100x, which gives you uh, confident data. But when you have a variant that is less than 25, you have to take it cautiously, and you should always ask for Sanger validation. So there are different platforms on the basis of output. So currently we have this instrument in our department. This is INS5 ion torrent range. For, uh, we, uh, we, we use it for uh, gene panel sequencing. And this is accompanied by the Iron Chef, which we use for the experimental workflow of the NGS. And very soon we are going to get one of these Illumina platform in our department as well. So if we have to compare the Sanger and NGS, so NGS gives you sensitivity up to 1%. As in the case of Sanger, it is only 20%. It has high discovery power, high mutation resolution. Of course, more data is produced with the same amount of DNA. And it has higher sample throughput. However, it is less cost effective when you have target or gene less than 20. And it becomes time consuming when you have lesser targets to be analyzed. So coming to uh, different types of NGS, we have targeted panels, whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. So we'll discuss one by one. So targeted sequencing involves analysis of specific set of targets associated with a particular condition or group of condition that may or may not be similar. So these panels are designed to target genes that are known to be relevant to specific clinical questions. And the panel may include single gene, few, or many genes, depending on the purpose of the test. So this is the basic workflow of the test. Basically, we amplify only the target regions which we uh, need to analyze. And then the data analysis is done according to that. Uh, I'll give you an example of this panel, which we do it routinely in our hematology lab. It is IBMF panel. So it contains 33 genes of different associated uh, diseases and syndromes. So here is the example of a case, uh, eight-year-old female with a clinical suspicion of Ankeny's anemia and with presented with pancytopenia and constitutional abnormalities. And we perform targeted NGS panel and we found the compound head gene in uh, compound head variant in Fank 
C gene. And this is just a view of the sequence uh, viewer of the ion torrent platform. So here is the two variants that we had reported for this particular case. So again, another panel is iron-related inherited anemia-based parent uh, panel. So it is based on citroblastic, non-citroblastic, and secondary iron overload, and it contains 26 genes. And so, as I said, you can use it for a single type of disease or condition, or similar uh, diseases or conditions. So, what are the advantages of targeted sequencing? Since it is uh, comprehensive, it gives you efficient testing, it becomes cost effective, and therefore it becomes faster compared to other NGS techniques. However, there are some limitations as well. Since the panel contains only specific number of genes, other potential disease-causing genes outside the panel may be missed. Variants of non-targeted genes that could contribute to patient's condition may not be detected. And it has limited flexibility, meaning when you design a panel and in literature some gene comes in reported to be associated with that particular condition, it is difficult to add a gene to that already going on panel. So to overcome these limitations, you have the option of exome sequencing. Now exome sequencing covers the entire protein coding region of individual genomes, individual genome. Uh, Although the exome comprises approximately only 1 to 2 percent of an entire genome, but includes vast majority of disease-causing genetic variants. So as there is too much of data in exome, the workflow and the analysis gets all the more complicated and difficult. However, the reporting guidelines are the same. So advantages of exome sequencing is it gives you comprehensive coverage for a wide range of disease-causing variants. It has potential for novel gene discovery, and it has flexibility in terms that it can be utilized for various clinical scenario as well as for reverse phenotyping. So what are the indication of targeted and whole exome sequencing? For targeted, it, the genetic condition should be well-defined. For example, cystic fibrosis, where there is only one gene is involved and it is very well-known fact. Although the gene is very huge and it is difficult to be sequenced by Sanger, so one can go for the panel testing. And the conditions where there is known genetic component. However, for whole exome sequencing, the condition is unclear, suspected to involve multiple genes, and where there is undiagnosed or complex cases are presented. Now, very often we come across the term clinical exome sequences. Uh, sequencing, which is not actually uh, exome sequencing. It does cover the uh, protein coding region of the genome. However, it covers only the genes that are associated or uh, reported to be associated with different diseases in databases such as OMIM, HGMD, and ClinVar. And it generally covers 6,000 to 8,000 genes. Advantages of clinical exome sequencing? It gives you enhanced coverage of disease-associated genes, mainly pathogenic and likely pathogenic ones. And it also gives you the deep intronic and promoter pathogenic mutations based on HGMD and ClinVar databases. And as in WES, it also gives you the coverage of mitochondrial genome as well. So what are the limitations of exome sequencing? Definitely the complexity and the cost, although it is not much more expensive than the panel testing, however, the complexity is very high and it may result you with the uh, incidental findings, which makes you, you know, difficult to be analyzed and diagnose the case. So mainly what you miss with the whole exome sequencing is the untranslated region promoters and bulk of introns. And to overcome that, one can go for whole genome sequencing. It gives you comprehensive everything what is there in the whole ge uh, in the genome of an individual, and therefore it allows you to detect the disease-relevant genomic vari variants beyond the exome, such as DNA structural alteration, deep intronic variants, variants in non-coding region, and repeat expansions. So as there is too much of data, the complexity of workflow and the data analysis becomes all the more complicated. 
So generally in whole genome sequencing, you have two parallel analysis going on. One is genotype driven and the other is phenotype driven. And once the variant is accumulated together, then you have to identify the causative variant as per your disease. So advantages is that it provides you high resolution base by base view, captures both large and small variants that might be, might be missed with targeted and exome approaches. It can ident identify potentially causative variants for further follow-up studies, and it can be also used for assembly of novel genomes. So if I have to give you a comprehensive view of data that is generated in whole exome and whole genome sequencing, so if we are sequencing the whole exome at 100x, the data generated is only 8 GB, while in whole genome sequencing at 30x coverage, you get the data of 120 GB. So you can see the difference of 8 to 120 and the complexity that is being there, and therefore it is very difficult to find a, a one variant from the whole genome data. So it is used only in a very rare scenarios where there is a known genetic component. However, it is not being uh, uh, analyzed by exome sequencing. So once again, going back to compare with the NGS, the discovery power and the number of samples can be increased from the Sanger to gene panels to exome to NGS. So let's come to some practical information regarding the DNA sequencing. So for uh, germline inherited disorders, for both Sanger and uh, NGS, you need only EDTA samples, two to three ml are enough, and if it has to be shipped can be shipped at room temperature for, uh, you know, two to three days. And further delay, if there is further delay, you can send it on ice packs. Same with shipping of DNA. Uh, one microgram of DNA is enough, and it can be shipped at RT unless it has to be, there is associated with any delays. So when you have a NGS report in hand, what one should look for it? Of course, the background, and then you comes the gene which is reported associated with the disease. So this is an example of a panel-based testing. So one should look for the disease and one should know the inheritance and whether it has been classified as pathogenic, likely pathogenic. And whenever there is a, a variant reported in, uh, in a report, one should always look at the bottom of the uh, report where there is evidence given for the that particular classification. So this is example of a clinical exome. There is a variant and there is description, the inheritance patterns, etc. And then there is evidence for which they have classified this particular variant as pathogenic. Is So evidence are to be given in every report for the classification. And as I was discussing regarding the depth and the coverage, one should always look at the bottom of the report for the mean coverage is given for this variant and what is the coverage for this particular panel. So there is another example of exome sequencing here, clinical exome sequencing. And again, they, have, they can have different parameters of uh, description, and, but it is always given with the mean depth and the, uh, the coverage for that particular panel. So coming to the challenges, as the NGS is a very sensitive test with a very um, uh, too much amount of data, Challenges are faced at different level. First, it starts in the clinic for the patient selection, whether that particular patient should be gives, tested for uh, NGS or not, whether it should be first year test or not, and then the turnaround and the cost time, whether the report which generally comes in three to four weeks would be utilized for the patient treatment or not, and then the cost, whether it is 
um, justified for that much amount of cost for that particular test. Then the data analysis, so uh, we are testing these days only by outsourcing, so the, there, there are many companies available, but it is difficult to um, understand whether that company has enough trained manpower for the bioinformatics analysis and whether they have access to various uh, databases for which we are, uh, uh, they are uh, using it for reporting. And when, while reporting, whether they, are, they have trained person or not, so I would suggest to go only for the reliable companies and just wait for a new company to, newer companies to get established. And then comes the major issues of variant interpretation, such as VUS and incidental findings, and then you have to communicate it, the, uh, communicate it with the patients. So it becomes challenging because you have the variant, but you don't know what to do with it because, you know, the disease is not being diagnosed. And then comes the di uh, counseling and data sharing part. So it, we generally do not have uh, trained genetic counselors in most of the OPDs. And then even for our patient data, we don't have any system to store the variants. So even if the variants which we had seen in a patient a few years back, we don't may not remember it. So basically, there should be a system where our own institutes or other institutes should, you know, deposit the, the variants which we find or associated, whether it is pathogenic or uh, VUS. And um, there are some databases where we can submit our uh, variant when you find it, such as ClinVar. However, you have to find out time, and it is challenging to, you know, understand the workflow and submitting the data, uh, your variant in the database. So among these challenges in day-to-day -day practice, one of the most challenging one is interpreting the VUS. You know, you have the variant, but it is difficult to make the understand the patient that uh, variant to mila hai, but aapke kaam ka nahi hai, you know. Uh, so it becomes very difficult for us to make them understand, first to us to understand the VUS and to make the patient understand. Um, it is very difficult to decipher a VUS. However, I can give you the guidelines what ACMG says about deciphering a VUS or management of VUS. So the ACMG says that a variant of unknown significance should not be used in clinical decision making. Rather, efforts to resolve the classification of the variant as pathogenic or benign should be undertaken. While the effort to reclassify the variant is underwent, Additional monitoring of patient for the disorder in question may be prudent. And viewers on their own should not change how the patients are treated. So in order to reclassify, multiple steps can be taken. However, for each variant, even for a single or the same gene, it is different. So at first step, one can look for the population database again. However, while reporting, it is also always considered what is reported in the healthy individual. But again, we can go and check back. For example, when a disease manifests in childhood, and there are some reports or there are some variants reported in the healthy individual database, we can just go back and check because if the variant is there, it means it is not the causative variant because it would have, you know, presented and the the data from that individual would not have been incorporated in that particular database. And then you can go for a, a family member evaluation, which gives you, which can give you a very clear picture when you have the samples from both affected and unaffected individual. Sometimes when we don't find a VUS in the uh, family, we try to interpret it as the, the, the variant has a different penetration. but one should not consider it unless you have uh, evidence for that. So one can go for extended family screening because if the variant is present in the family, it must have shown somewhere. Or you can also look for the, uh, in the literature. Even if you look for the literature, you should always look in the report what evidence they have given for that variant reclassification. And then comes the functional study. Actually, this is the way out for interpreting the, uh, the VUS. However, it is very difficult and one needs to have a proper research lab for this and it is not a one day's job. It takes a lot of time and effort for 
deciphering a, a variance pathogenicity in a research lab as well. And then the longitudinal and the cohort studies. So over the years when the similar phenotype is presented and associated with that particular data, it gets reclassified. And if you have some variant which you remember, you can just go and keep on checking in the literature again and again. But then it is obviously time taking and challenging. So uh, I will end my talk with this particular slide. Uh, informed consent and ethical considerations are very important in genetic testing. It itself is a huge topic of discussion. However, I'll just give you a, a take home message. So whenever there is a report with VUS or incidental finding, they one should go for genetic counseling and especially in the uh, scenarios of prenatal testing, genetic counseling is must, and one should always seek advice of a expert geneticist. There is no substitute for that. So with this, I end my talk.